Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N the Media I am Dr Nick Nickam the cardiology seminars are brought to you by Triple N Media our YouTube channel has more than 200 cardiology lectures you welcome to watch those we also kindly request you to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would like to get a copy of my cardiology rotations manual i will let you know at the end of this presentation how you can get one the feature presentation is uh, arterial pulse and its variations the arterial pulse could be just what we palpate in our wrist it could be through the pulse oximeter or it could be through an arterial line it could be in a cardiac catheterization lab but we're going to talk about many different conditions how arterial pulse varies and helps with the diagnosis the best way to palpate an arterial pulse is by using three fingers while you use the two outer fingers to stabilize the artery the middle finger feels the pulsations a lot of people do with one finger or like this that's not the best way this is the proper way to monitor the pulse depending upon how good the pulse is we say the pulse is weak the pulse is thready the pulse is bounding they, we can grade them as if you don't feel any pulse at all like if you are in a cardiac arrest uh, situation the pulse is absent zero if it's barely palpable like blood pressure is like 50 60 and doing a cpr and you feel it and you know you may be feeling on the femoral or the carotid you just feel a little little twitch that's like barely palpable so this is a zero this is one and this is supposed to be two and three is slightly diminished and palpating the pulse becomes very important during cpr that's why it's important to know how well you can feel the pulse number 4 is normal you have a bounding pulse correspondingly you have a good blood pressure let's look at hemodynamically what is happening inside the heart creating this pulse during ventricular systole when the ventricle squeezes against closed mitral and aortic valves there is increase in intraventricular pressure while the volume remains the same but as the intraventricular pressure increases beyond the diastolic pressure in the aorta the aortic valves open then we have an ejection of the blood increasing the pressure and volume in the aorta giving rise to the upstroke of the arterial wave this is the rapid ejection phase this is followed by slow ejection phase during which the pulse begins to come down but uh, it keeps track with the left ventricular pressure until the ventricle relaxes enough when its pressure drops below that of the aortic pressure the aortic valves close causing the diacrotic notch here after that the aortic pressure continues to come down and reaches the diastolic number before a new cycle begins depending upon the wave contour depending upon the height of the wave depending upon the time which it takes to reach the peak there are many different conditions that we can relate to when we are looking at pulse we need to pay attention to all these different parameters we need to look at the rate we need to look at the rhythm is the pulse regular or irregular is the pulse irregular is it irregularly irregular or is it regularly irregular for example you get normal beat normal beat pause normal beat normal beat pause normal beat normal beat pause so then you know you're dealing with some kind of a trigeminy whereas if you have atrial fibrillation it is normal beat 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 just by feeling the pulse you can determine is the patient having a regular regular rhythm or their ectopic beats is the rhythm irregular you feel for the volume pulse volume which we talked about in the previous slide about the grading system the force with which the pulse comes the pulse may come just like slow motion or it could be it can 
forcefully. Tension is related to the diastolic blood pressure. If the diastolic blood pressure is high, then the pulse is sort of uh, hangs around, it, it just doesn't come down. <laughs> then we need to compare both sides. If someone has a subclavian steel syndrome, the blood pressure or the pulse could be pretty weak on the left side compared to the right side. Always compare pulses on both sides when you're checking the extremities. In elderly patients, you can see their arteries are calcified, they are like railroad tracks, they are very stiff, they are non-compliant, and the arterial walls, you can feel them, they could be tortuous, and they can give rise to pretty high systolic blood pressure. Pulse deficit. When you listen to the heart, you hear an irregular rhythm. Then when you check the pulse, you, you see the pulse doesn't match with the the heart rate that you get at the apex. That's because if you're having an atrial fibrillation, some of the weak waves may not generate enough pressure to generate a pulse. As a result, you're gonna feel a pulse deficit when you listen to the heart and compare with the pulse you get at the wrist or in the groin. When the heart pumps the blood, not all the impulse is transmitted instantaneously. The blood is liquid. It has to move through the arterial system and this motion of blood and the kinetic energy takes time. After the blood leaves the aorta, it takes 30 milliseconds for the blood to reach the carotids. It takes 80 milliseconds to reach the radial arteries, 75 milliseconds to reach the femorals and 60 milliseconds to reach the brachial. Here are different waveforms, which I'm gonna go through one by one. And here we have a nice brisk upstroke. Remember now I said brisk upstroke because there are situations where the upstroke could be slow and lazy. Then we have a brisk downstroke here. Then we have the dichrotic notch, then a gradual decline to the diastolic baseline pressure. So that is the normal arterial pulse. But there are, there are certain circumstances where you have a, like a slightly decreased upstroke compared to this upper tracing, and you may not see even see the dichrotic notch. You may see this in patients with a sort of low cardiac output. Here we have an adequate pulse, brisk upstroke, but there is lack of dichrotic notch but there are some mild variations in the respiratory cycle indicating the LV filling is varying with respirations. So there are a lot of things we can derive by looking at the pulse. A lot more information here. As you can see, the pulse wave is blunted. The upstroke is gradual. The downslope is also very gradual. You don't see the dichrotic notch. Sometimes if you see this on an arterial line, the first thing you need to make sure, the first thing is to make sure that you're not dealing with an air bubble in the line. So the line needs to be flushed so there's no clot there and clean up the, the system and recalibrate the pressure. If you still see the same thing, then we are talking about the slow upstroke, slow downslope, low pulse volume, low cardiac output. We see this in patients with shock, hypotension, volume depletion, severe heart failure with low ejection fraction, or patients with hypothyroidism. When we see low volumes with significant variations during the respiratory cycles, it may also suggest underlying significant lung disease. Now let's look at some of the variations that we might come across with reference to the arterial pulse. Here is a, a hyperdynamic uh, waveform, very brisk upstroke. And in fact, we have a, like a double notch here in the systolic phase. Then we have the dichrotic notch here. Then we have the, di di the wave coming down to the end diastolic level. This is called the collapsing pulse or the water hammer pulse or the corrigan or the corrigan pulse. As I mentioned, it has a rapid upstroke, rapid downstroke, high amplitude, short duration, and this is found in patients with uh, high volume status. 
like aortic regurgitation, where you have the water hammer pulse, low diastolic blood pressures in the 40s and 50s. Then it can also be seen in patients with patent ductus arteriosus, fever, anemia, even pregnancy, AV fistula, like in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease who are on dialysis. A couple of words about the pressures. This represents the end diastolic pressure, which is approximately 80 millimeters of mercury on an arterial line. And this is the systolic blood pressure. And uh, here we have the diastolic runoff. Here's the dichrotic notch. This area represents the mean arterial pressure. Of course, the computers calculate the mean arterial pressure and put a straight line on top of the arterial pulse waveform, which helps us to monitor the blood pressure and also monitor the drugs that we use to maintain mean arterial pressure above 70 or 80 millimeters of mercury. Here are some di different variations of the pulse. Here is a low output, slow upstroke uh, hypokinetic pulse. Then we have what is called the parvus et tardus pulse, which is characteristic of aortic stenosis, which I'm going to touch upon in a minute. The hyperkinetic pulse, which I talked about already. Then we have the visperians pulse, which is seen in patients with the, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with mid-cavitary uh, mid obstruction. Then we have a dichrotic pulse, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the coming slides. When we go from an ascending aorta to the femoral artery, the blood pressure goes up by about uh, 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. That's something we need to keep in mind. Also, the waveforms change. Pulses parvus et tardus that is seen in patients with uh, significant aortic stenosis. First, the upstroke is slow. It is slow and low volume because there's not much going through a critical aortic stenosis. Number two, the downslope is also kind of slow. So there is prolongation of the, the ejection phase. Then the dichrotic notch is seen. And then we have a slow decline to the baseline diastolic pressure. So the Characteristic features of uh, pulses tardus versus pulses parvus at tardus is slow rise, slow fall, prolonged pulse duration, reduced amplitude, lazy pulse. Think about aortic stenosis. In some patients, we may also see a notch in the upstroke of this slow rise in arterial pressure in patients with aortic stenosis along with the other changes which I talked to you in the previous slide. Now here is a hyperdynamic heart where we have a very brisk upstroke and a straight uh, downslope with low dichrotic notch suggesting increase in volume, increase in vascular capacity, vasodilatation. And where are we going to see these conditions? In patients with anemia, patients with fever, patients with AV fistula, patients with aortic regurgitation, pregnancy, and thyrotoxicosis. Anytime there is vasodilatation, increased vascular bed, there is very little resistance for the blood to go through. As a result, you get a pretty low diastolic pressure, and because of increased volume, you get increased uh, output causing a big pulse wave. A couple of other conditions. This is a pulses alternance and this is pulses paradox. I have done a separate video on pulses paradox, which is a very important topic, especially for cardiology fellows. So you may want to watch that video. I'm just going to mention it briefly here. Pulses alternance can be seen in patients uh, with uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Pulses paradox is uh, seen in patients with uh, constrictive pericarditis large pericardial effusion, restrictive cardiomyopathy, any condition that uh, impairs the right ventricular film. So please watch that video on Pulses Paradox where I explain it in detail. There's one more thing I would like to cover and that is the dichrotic pulse. 
Don't confuse dichrotic pulse with dichrotic notch that we see on the pulse. We already have a dichrotic notch. Why do we need a dichrotic pulse? Well, there is a dichrotic pulse because uh, if you look at it, the dichrotic notch happens just before the end of systole, whereas the dichrotic pulse has a dichrotic notch that is happening during the early part of diastole. And this is seen in patients with low cardiac output, like patients with heart failure, dilated cardiomyopathy, dehydration. If you look at the waveform, you will notice that the dichrotic notch happens just before the second heart sound. That's at the end of uh, the ejection phase. However, the dichrotic pulse is where your dichrotic notch is seen somewhere during the early phase of the ventricular diastole. So that's the difference. So please make note, dichrotic pulse is different from a dichrotic notch seen on a regular arterial pulse. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a quick overview of uh, pulse and its variations. Our YouTube, chat, our YouTube channel has more than 200 cardiology lectures. So feel free to watch them and please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to get a copy of my cardiology rotations manual, which has more than 175 pages of useful information to enrich your cardiology rotation experience, please send me an email to drnicknickum at gmail.com and I will be happy to send that one. This cardiology seminar has been brought to you by Triple N Media. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. I will see you in the next video.